Uh, Betty, I think you were the first to arrive. So uh, why don't you start us off? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Uh, so I'm Betty, uh, co-founder of Akala and Karura. Uh, so yeah, so happy to be here calling in from Auckland, New Zealand. Yeah. Nice. Um, Tyrone? Hi. Oh, hi, everybody. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, yeah, very nice to see you. And actually, yeah, Bifros is, uh, uh, as you know, it's a uh, yeah, subscript based DeFi protocol to provide, you know, the liquidity for pledge assets, such as, you know, staking derivatives in different, in different post chains. And we are actually currently doing the uh, uh, Kusama slot auction uh, bidding liquidity protocol, uh, which name is the SLP. And yes, yeah, stay tuned for it. Awesome. Um, Alex. Yeah. Hi, guys. I'm Alex, uh, the CEO and the founder with Equilibrium and Jinchiri teams. Uh, so we're uh, creating the uh, all-in-one platform, which delivers certain functionality of uh, almost uh, all the DeFi primitives that you, that you can even imagine. Uh, so the platform allows for uh, actually earning yields, uh, borrowing, and uh, trading on margin, uh, all major cryptocurrencies uh, that are bridged from um, blockchains connected with uh, with Polkadot and Kusama. So currently we are participating in the um, crowdloan uh, campaign uh, with uh, our Kusama, Kusama candidate for, for the parachain slots. Um, if you're interested, uh, follow us and uh, join the crowdloan campaign. Awesome. So uh, I think Maki is still uh, joining us. So we'll just uh, wait a little bit for him. And uh, as we're doing this, I'll introduce myself. So I'm Kenny. I'm one of the uh, co-founders of Manta Network. And uh, you guys heard all about us in the keynote. So I won't have to uh, repeat myself there. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys for joining us. And um, I guess while we're waiting for Maki, we could probably just start the conversation, right? Like I, I think a really really simple question here is, you know, as founders uh, and, you know, just, just people hands on in projects, I'm, I'm curious to know, are you personally concerned about your own privacy when it comes to, you know, your transactions, your crypto assets, and, you know, what are, what are you really concerned about there? Maybe we can start with uh, Tyrone. Hi. So, cool. So what I'm concerned about my own non-chain privacy, right? Uh, yeah, for me, actually, my only concern is the same as actually most DeFi users, I think. So although I trust the blockchain, but um, I don't really want to explore my flaw of my found. So what's the difference that anyone can track you, uh, debit, um, cash flow? So do you trust the bank you use? So so, but the situation now is that you trust, but the blockchain is traceable, traceability, right? So, which is the significant feature that cannot be changed, but instead, um, I can use Mixer to confuse the path of my transactions to avoid the, the tracer of the, actually those uh, followers and make it not easy for us to trace my uh, actions, but indeed uh, actually um, sacrificed a part of my trust to 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 trust the service to mix it because uh, some of it is actually centralized because I did transfer my asset to to the to the mixer right so that's that's the method uh, I used and uh, that's what I concern about the my own privacy on the on chain Gotcha. Betty, Alex, anything to add there? Um, I can take it over. So, uh, you know, the, the thing is that the world uh, uh, overall has become very transparent, right? So uh, basically everyone knows uh, where, where you're based, uh, where, what, what 
what's what's your kind of uh, area where you're moving around and uh, so on and so forth go because of social media networks and stuff you're always checking in and uh, everything everything but the financial privacy is still with us right if it comes to the more traditional banking system because uh, uh, you know literally a few days ago I caught I actually found myself thinking like okay so I'm transferring money to some accounts uh, through like regular banking system and uh, whether I can look at this uh, this account and to find out what's the balance there because uh, you know it's the obvious thing that if you're transferring something on blockchain you can definitely go to the block explorer to find out what's the balance of that account uh, so obviously uh, in the traditional banking system it's it's it's, it's impossible right and uh, maybe there is uh, uh, some certain confidence uh, and uh, actually uh, comfort coming from uh, this privacy which still remains for regular for regular users of regular banks uh, but on blockchain, it's obviously everything transparent, and we know that each single transaction can be uh, tracked. And uh, eventually, uh, you know, we can think of crypto as of cash uh, in this sense, right? Because you hold the private keys, you you always like keeping that this private key, private keys with you with you, like when you're moving around and stuff. So obviously, I'm not I'm not I, I don't feel feel like comfortable when. Um, uh, transactions can be tracked, and I and I, I can be identified behind these transactions, uh, specifically if it comes to some significant amount of funds, right? Um, and obviously here here you know certain you know privacy issues um, um, uh, definitely um, uh, come up, and uh, we're definitely uh, interested in solving this 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 privacy privacy issues through certain you know technology um uh sort of setups and, and and so on and so forth but you know another point side of that is um, actually regulation right because if you are doing everything super super in super privacy mode right and uh, no one can track what, what what you actually did uh, in this case um you know certain problems with regulation can be raised right and so uh, yeah you always need to find the balance between between the total privacy and between the transaction which can be private for everyone on the network but in some special cases they, they can be uh, revealed uh, to figure out what exactly is going on behind these transactions that's my perspective on that gotcha and then uh betty anything to add there i know we've got uh quite a few different perspectives from tyrone and alex so far uh yeah, maybe I'll just give an example uh, what's quite scary is uh, I think this also shows we're uh, in a very early stage of building the blockchain industry because I think in Web2, um, I think everyone is conscious of protecting uh, customers' privacy, but they just don't have the means to actually really protect it, right? Because our data still get leaked. I still get phone calls every day from different salespeople in different industries. Uh, but in Web3, I think... Uh, uh, there, there are, you know, I, I saw one case where uh, in a in a Web3 decentralized social network, it's quite cool that you can link up your identity using your uh, public public key, but all, all of a sudden your net wealth ex exposed as well uh, with with your photo and then how much you own in different coins, um, and that's a bit awkward and quite embarrassed. Uh, but I think it's just because we're very early on and everyone is trying to. Uh, piece different uh, like uh, puzzles together, and that's probably also the beauty of Polkadot, where you know each one of us sitting here, uh, we are specialized in a particular area because it's just not possible to just build anything that's generalized but still very superior, right? Uh, which we have experimented in the past era of blockchain that you run, uh, you know, uh, generalized networks, um, and you experiment a whole bunch. But if you want to do something really great, uh, that takes everyone, you know, here uh, and also more in the Polkadot ecosystem and beyond, I guess, to be able to, uh, you know, build really cool infrastructure and then all the infrastructure uh, can actually link up together that we can have uh, great DeFi uh, uh, applications plus it's privacy preserved uh, plus all the other desirable features that users want. So, yeah, so thanks. Awesome. Yeah, I think that I think that gets into a really interesting topic because you had mentioned how early we are in DeFi right now, right? And I'd like to better understand exactly what each and every one of your visions are in terms of what DeFi looks like three to five years from now. But 
before we get to that, right, I know uh, Yuba has joined us and um, Yuba, if you don't mind just introducing yourself and your project and uh, the, the question we're passing around right now is, you know, what's what's been kind of your personal experience with on-chain privacy? Yuba, um, I'm the founder of Parallel Finance. Um, we are uh, building uh, DeFi solutions on Polkadot Network. And when previously I've been in the crypto space for the last four and a half years doing investments and then developments. Um, my personal experience with uh, privacy on chain would be the fact that um, we had a lot of issues with exposing the transactions and network net worth. Um, sometimes I would say that the transactions are very um, secretive and we don't want everyone to see it, um, especially with some deals with um, um, some parties that we have, you know, uh, NDAs or agreements. But obviously, as long as we expose that information, especially the transaction hash on chain, then there's no way we can get it back. It is very different than um, um, than than because it is information. Once exposed on the internet, then it is there. And then um, another experience that I had is basically linking up the investors for certain projects. So um, sometimes I think it's very easy to connect uh, the trace on chain with respect to the previous project they invested or the transaction type of transaction they have done. Um, so cross source information you can find specific or very, very likely you know who that uh, person is behind the accounts, especially with the Ethereum account model. Um, the UTXO model seems better, but still there's a lot of way to track it. Um, so that's sort of my personal experience with investments and a lot of information get, get, get leaked. Gotcha. So it sounds like a lot of this privacy stuff really is going hand in hand with some of your own experiences with, I guess, not just on-chain transactions, but DeFi specifically. But before we get into that topic, right, like, I, I know there's been quite a few community questions as well around, you know, what is, I guess, just your vision in general about where DeFi is headed? What do you think that we're, we're missing right now, which defines us as early stage, early days? Uh, and Betty, you had kind of described it that way. So I'll let you take the floor first for that one. Uh, yeah, so I think we're uh, definitely headed towards uh, a multi-chain and also uh, a scalable composable future. Uh, because right now, um, we either try to uh, squeeze everything in one platform and we can't scale, uh, or uh, we are all doing you know, separate things separately. Uh, but I guess that's where Polkadot is bringing all of us towards, right? I can imagine once Polkadot uh, launches, uh, I think all of us here, uh, we're still at the infrastructure uh, level of building a lot of the building blocks. Um, you know, I can, I can imagine, you know, uh, once we all connect up and we launch our parachains, um, then it's sort of the layer two, like folks who's building the actual applications can actually uh, for example, you know, one click to bring Bitcoin and then land on to Akala and then cross over to maybe Menta or some privacy uh, chains and, and, and you turn, uh, you know, your transaction into a privacy transaction or privacy coin. Um, and then you can start earning, earning yield uh, or doing all sorts of various different stuff on these chains without even the users knowing you have already across multiple chains, just like today we're doing this crowdcast. I just click one button and I'm streamed. But behind the scene, there are many, many services that I have been uh, you know, using, right? So we, we are still at the stage of building all the individual services for the streaming that we are enjoying today. Uh, so yeah, so it takes a lot of effort for each one of us to be really good at what we do, but also be able to, uh, I guess, connect to each other uh, uh, and then yeah, empower more applications built on top of us. Awesome. I'll say that, and I'm sure anyone who's tried to run a Crowdcast event in the past will agree that it's much more than just a click of a button with Crowdcast. <laughs> There's always all sorts of things that kind of pop up and you're, you're trying to put out little fires. But I, I think overall, the analogy was very appropriate. Um, uh, so I guess, uh, Alex, what do you think? Uh, do, do, you, do you agree with Betty's perspective, right? Or are you, are you thinking about a different future for DeFi? 
makes sense. And um, a lot of uh, aspects I actually also wanted to bring up, uh, specifically the multi-chain approach to building DeFi applications. And um, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, boundaries between networks will be eventually erased thanks to uh, layer zero solutions like Polkadot and uh, other networks. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that uh, the future is definitely interoperable and cross-chain. Uh, on another hand, uh, we see the um, clear trend for creating the all-in-one DeFi platforms, uh, like uh, the most of them uh, appearing on different blockchain networks, including Polkadot, uh, like our colleagues from, uh, per se, Akala, Karura, and uh, also Parallel, by the way. Uh, we, we are also striving to build up the platform, which will include multiple use cases, uh, rather than ju just building some niche products. And I think that like, it, it actually um, uh, taking roots from um, maybe early movers in the DeFi space, like, uh, for example, Synthetics or um, even MakerDAO, they also were working on some building up some conglomerates of DeFi pro products, um, like they were building on exchange, stablecoin, and so on and so forth. They ended up with just stablecoin, seems like that. But um, anyways, like I think that the future is, is belongs actually to the project that will be uniting all these use cases, right? And um, I think the uh, the 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 major goal for for the current DeFi projects that are just you know entering the markets or maybe even more established whatever, uh, since it's very still very early days for for the industry, uh, the the main goal for us is uh, uh, the user acquisition and defining your space in 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 the overall crypto space right where exactly you're operating. Um, like uh, onboarding as much as as many users as you can, um, get more liquidity traction, so on and so forth. Because uh, eventually, when it comes to some you know Cambrian explosion of DeFi, when it will eventually get the mass adoption, uh, you will be in the right place in the right time uh, with uh, all the efforts that you have put into your into your platforms. And um, um, actually, maybe just just one more thing that I wanted to mention in this connection. Um, so um, if, uh, if if it comes to um, to like the perspective on three four years, we definitely will see more regulation coming into this space, right? And I'm sure that we'll we'll uh, touch multiple times on that during today's conversation, specifically in the, with regards to privacy. Uh, but eventually, it will be sort of you know symbiosis between the actual DeFi, uh, maybe more traditional banking products and institutions and stuff. And uh, the like from the user perspective, the eventual DeFi protocols will definitely will have everything under the hoods. The user will never know which technology backs the, the system. Uh, they will, the one thing that they just need to know that it's reliable, secure, and actually can bring certain value to that. Gotcha. Yeah, I think definitely when it comes to product maturity and I guess just market maturity, right? Like having those layers of abstraction are definitely important because then that that kind of speaks towards the overall user experience, right? Being able to use things as a utility, right? Having to just flip the lights on and not have to worry about where the electricity is sourced from, right? That's that's sort of the convenience that we should be going towards as well. And so I guess, you know, for you or Tyrone, um, it seems like one of the resonating themes here is the the overall idea of composability and interoperability in the future of DeFi. Uh, do you guys agree? Do you guys have additional perspective on that? I totally agree with that. Uh, I think um, just to add on to the points uh, from uh, Betty and Alex, um, one of the things that I think the future DeFi should have is a very robust uh, uh, insurance systems. Currently, the DeFi market has been hacked in this year over um, I think close to close to billions of dollars after the massive six hundred million dollar hack, and um, it has been increasing over time, especially uh, uh, you know on top of the especially the fact that more and more people try to yield farm on uh, multi chains. Um, so in order to have, um, I think um, massive adoptions, uh, we definitely need to have a better um, insurance payoff um, scenarios. Um, and that actually requires to have a higher levels of composabilities on chain data uh, acquisition and then a very robust and, and, and um, high performance um, 
um, you know, computation on chain in order to calculate the price, in order to detect the claim assessments, you know, to make it more decentralized. Um, on the other hand, I feel like um, the future of DeFi should have a, a very, um, or should at least provide optionalities for privacy. Um, uh, the true financial freedom um, shouldn't be exposed um, uh, or at a cost of um, or own information being exposed and can be hided. So it should have an optionality for that and people could actually pay a fee. Well, at least there will be a premium for the privacy optionality and that would be definitely the future. Yeah, I mean, I, I think definitely the, the the concept of you know regulatory compliance um, these are these are all things that kind of have to intersect with the conversation around privacy and then I, it seems like you you also tend to agree about the general interoperability concepts I'm curious to know you know Tyrone do you what do you think three to five years from now DeFi it's interoperable but what else right right I'm totally agree with uh, yeah with you guys and. Uh, you know, I think uh, indeed we that that the privacy is for sure is necessary for us. And in the next three or five years, and what we need to do is that I think that yeah, the, you know, the government would mention about the Pogdo actually is uh, ecosystem to bring up with alien uh, alien chain in it with you know the governance and you know enterprises the level of blockchain. So. Uh, in the future, actually, I think we need a flexible uh, privacy solution to consider the future of the uh, cryptocurrency world or the blockchain world. Is this privacy solution should be actually inclusive and it can achieve complete uh, privacy and hide the user's transaction identity and transaction amount. And at the same time, either considering needs of enterprises and supervision. So users can also choose the um, accountability privacy mode to maintain transaction in the system or uh, I can choose not even show any of my information on chain so it is accountable and traceable to the meet of requirements of real world uh, you know some such as you know KYC scenarios for for some uh, centralized exchange or decentralized exchange um, as well so yeah, that's that, that's my idea. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a really interesting concept because, you know, I think one of the really ch big challenges of user experience is once you introduce this idea of choice, right? Like, because every time you give the users optionality, that that's another friction, right? That's another point in time where they kind of slow down and decide which sort of uh, path to take. And, um, you know, I, I, I know composability, privacy, thank you guys, um, and user experience, regulation seem to be all resonating themes here. Uh, and it sounds like those are, those are some of the key areas that we need to tackle uh, before we can really call this space mature. I, I'd like to go down a little bit deeper onto the user experience side, right? And this kind of crosses into composability because, you know, when we hear composability, and we hear interoperability, and we hear layer twos, right? Like, let's let's really try to boil this down and try to understand exactly what the difference is here, right? Because, like, for me, as a I guess as a yield farmer, the yield farmer side of me, you know, I go on I don't know um, Ethereum and some layer twos, and I yield farm on the layer twos, and you know, you've got to swap to different networks and all this other stuff. And, you know, once you do it three to five times, then it becomes less intimidating than before. But for the average user, right, just hopping to a layer two is still extremely intimidating, right? Like, how does, I guess, because we're all, you know, sort of substrate based projects here, and we're all thinking about interoperability, right? Like from the user experience side, do you see really a big difference between how people are hopping from, you know, ETH to layer twos right now versus how, you know, the, the polka dot substrate ecosystems will be interacting? And do you think it'll be a better user experience? I know it's a pretty heavy question, but Alex, you, you look like the kind of person that can answer this. So I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I, I'll try all my best. <laughs> Uh, so the, the the thing is like <laughs> we, we at Equilibrium and uh, Jinchir we're standing for um, better user experience by far, and uh, we we always get stick to you know sleek interfaces and uh, better user flows within our product line that we're building. Uh, like we, we we do have a lot of on our plate, you know that we have a lending platform, we have the decentralized exchange, which is based on the order. So overall, it's uh, complicated itself. But if we add uh, to that the complexity of network transactions, uh, that actually will, will make things even more sophisticated for the average users by far. So um, actually, like we we think that even with the um, uh, with the um, with the current developments of, of this abstract framework and uh, the current development of Polkadot and uh, Kusama. Um, uh, the the user experience is um, is it actually can be improved, right? Because uh, first of all, like the one pain point is switching between wallets, right? So the average Ethereum user actually got used to working with MetaMask, and um, just maybe the most complicated thing that uh, the the average DeFi user on Ethereum can do is just uh, you know with MetaMask is to, to add some, some custom network into that and uh, do constant switching between that. Um, in, in the case of, um, uh, of um, um, user experience and interaction with, uh, with parachains and substrates, uh, beyond, be, besides that, they will need to, um, at least if they're using desk, desktop applications, they will need to install the additional extension which will leverage uh, the um, the substrates and uh, the parachains um, which are already a little bit you know sensitive thing because uh, um, not that many people actually want to install something some something additionally to what they already have right so um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking into uh, integration of you know, substrates and parachains into MetaMask in this sense. Uh, I know that EVM, uh, like those who are actually delivering the functionality of EVM on um, on their parachains, they're actually, some of these projects, like for example, uh, Plasm and Moonbeam, they, they, they've been working on uh, these integrations. Um, and eventually it seems like it will make the user experience more seamless, right? Um, but still, I think that there, there, there's a lot of to, a lot of things to improve. Uh, from 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 the user user standpoint. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And maybe maybe sorry. maybe just just one just just one thing I wanted to add to that. So we, we recently um, launched our um, Jinchir developments into production as a standalone substrate because we're still pending um, to get the slots on on Kusama. Uh, and we actually have uh, uh, have launched that with uh, alongside with our bridges that we have developed with uh, Ethereum and BC networks, and we already have this hands-on experience in bridging. You know, overall, it it, it actually works well, uh, right? Uh, if we don't take into account uh, obviously Ethereum um, uh, cost of uh, of transactions on Ethereum, uh, right? Uh, with BC, it's uh, pretty slick, right? Like the transaction looks very beautifully perfect without any kind of you know delays and, and stuff um and very cheap uh at the same time uh but again this you know switching between uh between networks switching between wallets extensions uh, still can be complicated yeah definitely and i i, I do I, I think one point that you brought up that i really resonated with was the um the wallet adoption on MetaMask, right, with the uh, the ERC twenty supported chains. Um, I've I've been playing around a lot with Moon River, um, and you know the the experience is fairly seamless there. Uh, but only because I'm so familiar with MetaMask, right? I I already see that um, uh, one of the comments from the audience here is that you know user experience is crucial. Uh, but the Polkadot wallet interface is not so user friendly. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, like you, definitely Polkadot is in its early stages. And so we've got a long way to go there. But I mean, there is, there is, I, I think apart from Polkadot.js, there's a lot of third party services that are starting to build out wallet products as well. Uh, we had the, the, we had the, I guess, 
the fortunate uh, experience of talking with Fearless Wallet just this week. And, you know, I've been playing around with their uh, wallets and that, it's been a pretty good experience, especially for a, for a mobile wallet experience. And so I'm pretty excited about that. But, you know, getting back to the just the question of like user experience with like the, the composability aspect of Polkadot and how it's so unique. Um, really curious to know from your perspective, Betty, because, you know, Akala has been doing a lot of these uh, sort of composability tests, right? Like I, I know, like we just completed one a couple of weeks ago, and you know what? I, I, I guess right now, right? It's it's still fairly on the technical back end side, but how do you see this manifesting on the front end to make it really easy for the users? Uh, when I say user, I always think of people like my mom and dad or my uncles. You know, like I think. In, in the in the remainder of my life, I don't think I can actually help them to even manage Ledger, uh, even regardless how cool MetaMask may be uh, or how you know Polkadot JS might evolve to be. I don't think that's their thing, and and they represent ninety nine percent of the population on on the planet. So if we are gonna get there to let everyone actually be able to use all the stuff we use, we gotta cross that chasm, right? I think uh, using a wallet and even directly interact with all the chains. Uh, here, we're still talking about we're early adopters. We still have the concept of the cross chain. Uh, I think when we get to the level of mass adoption, there's no concept of blockchains. Uh, you 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 are you're basically transparent to all the chains per se. Uh, you know, like on Polkadot, uh, I think when people say Polkadot JS is clunky, they mean just the UI. But when you're talking about interaction with multiple chains. Uh, you know, compared to MetaMask, you have to switch to different blockchains to use, right? And then uh, the Polkadot has already gone through the technical upgrade where the chain concept is very minimalized because you have one set of keys. Uh, there's no switch off network. If you land on any of the, you know, front end that uh, the network that built, uh, obviously we're still early stage, uh, you already arrive at a different blockchain right so there's there's no this thing as let me upload my asset or let me download my assets uh, like uh, you know the, the layer twos that's been building uh, elsewhere because uh, there's a difference between bottom-up approach and a top-down approach uh, Polkadot is a by-designed uh, architecture so uh, Gav when he left Ethereum he thought about all the stuff you know the, the pain points uh, that existed in the platform that he developed like the EVM uh, the Solidity platform, and when he designed Polkadot, all of those pain points, he basically addressed, right? And then we already test all of those on Kusama, everything actually works. So, um, but the bottom-up approach is currently the iterative approach, right? So you hit a war, uh, you know, you step back, and then you try a different different route. Oh, you know, there's a hole, let me patch it. Um, th this is basically what happened on, you know, Ethereum and also all the other platform that try to help, right? Basically, everybody's trying to help uh, to uh, Ethereum to scale up. Um, and then you realize everyone arrived at the same conclusion uh, because like even the hardest chain today is like Polygon, right? They literally reference like, you know, Polkadot is the best design and they are using exactly the same architecture. It's just when they, uh, you know, doing the consensus, it uses, you know, potentially Ethereum. They, they're only like talking about it in white paper, of course. Um, and the difference would just be, you know, the Polkadot team has spent three years building it. So, and then, you know, I think it's it's very cool that everyone, either through experiment uh, or through, you know, thinking and design thinking, we all arrive at similar sort of thoughts about where the future would be is this seamless uh, internet of blockchain world uh, that we are all trying to build. And then hopefully one day we, we, we no longer have this concept of chains is like you know my my mom going shopping uh he's uh, she's probably just like swipe the card and then pay for groceries but she didn't realize uh she already passed you know the privacy privacy chains behind the background uh, maybe she's using some of my bitcoin savings um uh, which is earning a dot uh staking yield and then doing some sort of you know fancy things converted back into dollars uh, but she doesn't r realize all the stuff that happened, you know, behind the scene. She just swiped the car and, and bought the eggs. So um, I, I think that's more of the future that I would like to see rather than stay at where we are. But that, that's why we're here, right? Every, every one of us here is trying to build towards something like that in the future. So, yeah. Definitely. And just, just a point of clarification for the audience. I think when Betty said that her mom is buying eggs, 
it's like physical eggs, not the NFT eggs, um, just in case anyone's confused. But um, <laughs> there's also could be uh, both. Could, <laughs> yeah, five years from now, your mom can buy NFT eggs, no problem. <laughs> yeah, just convert it from you know, getting diamonds. And, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, but I, I think another point that is kind of brought up is just, you know, like the on ramp for the 99%, right? Like right now, you know, the people here, um, we've all, we've all kind of arrived at the same conclusion, which is why we're all building on substrate. <laughs> and so um, definitely, you know, Betty pointed that out. Um, but also, you know, for the for the rest of the world, for the for the moms and dads and the grandparents out there who who are intimidated by the idea of alphanumeric wallet addresses, right? Like there's still that sort of on ramp that we need to figure out. Um, and with Polkadot being a new ecosystem, right? Like there's not really uh, such a direct on ramp to Polkadot without having to potentially go through other chains, go through centralized exchanges, right? And like we're we're a bunch of different DeFi projects here. And so I'm sure that the conversation about, you know, thinking about on ramps has been discussed. Um, curious to know, you know, how you guys think about it. Is this something that is in your product roadmap? And, you know, if so, like, what are some of the challenges around that? Um, and I don't know which one of you guys are thinking about on ramps. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it up to you to, to decide who wants to answer or take the first stab at it. <laughs> I, I think Barry can, can, can take over that. Sure. Oh, yeah. Right, go ahead. So. Yeah. No, this, this was just, just the, 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 the was just my parallel and by Frost to appear. Actually, I, actually, I was uh, I was trying to bring up the point that uh, the guys from Macala build, they're building the, their 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 wallets, I believe, right? So I think they definitely have something to say here. Okay. So I guess while we're waiting for Bifrost and Parallel, Batty, uh, no pressure, but now you have the stage. Oh, uh, on ramp and off ramp. Uh, yeah, I think I think that is something that's not a single chain can solve, uh, uh, and also it's probably not just Polkadot to solve as well. I think every single sort of blockchain project will have this challenge. Um, but I think we're all pleased to see even you know Jack Dorsey from Twitter is trying to solve that problem uh, for all of us, right? Uh, so I think you know right now we've already gone through the hurdle of uh, you know getting adoption and getting people's head around what is crypto, what is Bitcoin, and things like that. So once you build on RAM services for you know one set of coins, and that there will be many will be supported. So and and then right now there are many. Uh, various different type of uh, services because once you talk about on ramp, uh, so far there are still you have to have trusted way because that's the bridge between the fiat world and the crypto world. Right? So there are many many services already established that allow us to on ramp and off ramp. Uh, so and then there's also different ways to help users to on ramp or off ramp. And then there's also more fintech companies coming into the space as well, uh, which we are working with a number of them. So um and i think yeah so i don't think that is a future that is that too distant away uh it's more of like we need to get the infrastructure right and all the stuff should just work uh uh and then you know like when you said i think on ram offering relatively speaking technically is a easy thing uh to get across compared to uh all, all, all the people here trying to solve uh, way more uh, difficult problems right so yeah Interesting. So by by saying that it's a it's a relatively easy problem to solve, are you implying that it's more of like a compliance and regulatory issue? That's the problem rather than a technical bottleneck or like, how do you define easy there? Easy is like it's already possible, right? Because today you have many on ramp services and then it is a matter of, you know, integrating them into the platform and also the integration also you know, takes form in different shapes, right? When we feel it's fragmented, it's only because we're operating at the infrastructure level. That's why you feel things are all over the place. Uh, but once you actually get to the level of it's a real app, then you integrate with on ramp. It's very similar. It's just like, you know, you hook up your credit card or, or sometimes it's just a service that you link up to 
and then you can uh, on ramp and off ramp and then um and that's only just the beginning right this is only the service i'm talking about already available today but there are those folks who's continue to building in the area make it really easy so yeah gotcha okay so betty's perspective is that it is a it's a relatively simple question to question to tackle compared to what we're building out and there are already uh, I guess organizations, projects, third-party services that are uh, tackling that issue. Uh, curious to know. Oh, Alex is uh, reconnecting. So I guess you know, spotlights on you, Tyrone. I'm curious to know if um, if you guys are building any or thinking about any sort of on-ramp, off-ramps yourself. Tyrone, are you are you with uh, us? Hello, hello. Oh, uh, hey, I'm. Am I here? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Can I hear? You? Uh, I can hear you. So. So. Uh, where are we at? So. So. What's the. What's the question? Yeah. No. Yeah. So the question is, you know, are are you guys looking at think or are you guys thinking directly about any sort of like on ramp off ramp solutions or are you also thinking that um, you guys will be more so focused on um, using third party services, integration with other projects, uh, for that, for that on-ramp off-ramp, uh, provision. Um, actually, yeah, uh, we are currently not considering about the, uh, you know, third party to provide the on-ramp or off-ramp. And actually for me, I want to actually, uh, explain about the, uh, um, at present, you know, some um for the privacy level uh actually although those uh individual investors have um high degree of acceptance of the um uh, you know DeFi on the uh, public chains or such as ethereum but it cannot guarantee that the uh transaction powers privacy which uh greatly limits the uh application prospect of you know the uh enterprise users uh the you know in in the defi actually as uh by is uh you know the, for focused on the derivative and in the uh previous uh panel they also mentioned about the der derivative market is actually a, a trillion market and companies not only need to hide the you know the internal trading strategy and positions but um, in many cases, must also protect the privacy of uh, transaction data in, in accordance with the law. So, uh, for example, the uh, the law stipulates that uh, financial contracts must protect uh, transaction privacy, and one of the main reason is to you know prevent the phenomenon of you know corruption in transaction. So since the court um, public uh, chain cannot meet the uh, requirements of enterprises in term of in term of privacy, so uh, we hence start to uh, consider it, and we think it will be actually necessary term that needs to be that needs to be handled. But um, it's rather a third party for us. But um, actually, I don't know. <laughs> Sure, no problem. Sounds like sounds like it's a, a problem to solve in the future state of Bifrost. Um, but I guess right. you know, in the last in the last like ten minutes of this conversation, I kind of want to bring the same type of question back to the idea of privacy. And you know, we're all working on DeFi projects here, and, and now that Manta is really tackling the privacy side, um, I, hopefully as a Polkadot parachain, right, will alleviate some sort of pressure on that user experience. But I'm curious to know, you know, before before Manta came along, and you guys were working on these DeFi projects. Um, how, did the conversation about privacy come up before? And you know, in what capacity? And what did you guys conclude as a project uh, about how privacy would fit in or what role it would take? Um, Alex? Very, very good question. Thanks very much. So um, firstly, I think that, um, as I said, privacy plays a very important role for the for users who are not that confident with uh, tracking their 
their transactions and um, uh, the actual amount of funds that they are holding in their bags. And uh, from from this from this perspective, uh, from this perspective, uh, definitely privacy might um, actually play a significant and very important role for um, um, improving the user experience for this for these types of um, of customers. Um, I'm sure that, for example, bigger investors um, like um, funds and liquidity providers, uh, they might be also in need of uh, you know some solution for privacy uh, because uh, they might not be comfortable with uh, tracking of uh, their kind of um, amounts of funds, the leftovers on their wallets and so on and so forth. Um, um, and um, again, so we, we, we don't clearly know how exactly this will be considered from the perspective of regulation, uh, because uh, obviously, like I'm not sure that uh, regulators will be comfortable with uh, such level of privacy when you you won't be able to figure out um, like who exactly uh, transacted, how to apply taxes on certain transactions, so on and so forth, because it's the obvious uh, kind of coin side of, uh, of of privacy. Um, so um, I, I, I personally don't have the answer to the regulatory issues that might be raised uh, through this sort of uh, privacy solutions. Uh, but definitely, again, from the perspective of uh, the um, improvements of user experience for these specific categories of users, uh, that definitely makes sense to, to integrate some you know, uh, solutions uh, in, in this uh, privacy field. Gotcha. Betty or Tyrone, curious to know how your projects were thinking about privacy before Manta came along, I guess. Uh, yeah, we, we think uh, privacy is like a uh, uh, a compulsory uh, component uh, if we really want to scale uh, DeFi for more users. And then at the same time, uh, we also recognize it's a specialized field. Not everyone is a cryptography uh, experts um, and not everyone can actually uh, solve those you know hard uh, cryptography problems uh, like zero knowledge and things like that um, so uh, I think that's also uh, we, we kind of like feel really comfortable in a polka dot ecosystem is where uh, chains can specialize or teams can actually specialize in a particular area without losing ref uh, relevance um, because you know, once you solve the uh, fundamental challenge of privacy, then uh, in uh, in the substrate, so the ecosystem, those technology can be applied directly, uh, or using you know crushing uh, technology uh, to kind of like compose with other blockchains, and then all of a sudden, uh, all of us here in the ecosystem can benefit from that you know, specialization or from that product or service rollout from you know, uh, uh, chains like Manta or, or others, right? So I think that is sort of the beauty uh, where we are in, in such an uh, ecosystem. And it's also why it's very important that uh, at a very fundamental level, all the chains should be composable with each other. Um, so uh, right now, there's, the technology is you know, defined by the XCM, so the crushing messaging format. Uh, but actually, it takes each one of us uh, to actually implement it and then be able to like, kind of like communicate our chains to each other. So not only just the tokens can, uh, can cross to each other's chains, but also services, right? This is very important, like uh, privacy services or added DeFi services, or I'm sure like, there are other services that are able to kind of like uh, cross to each other so that uh, layers above us uh, that they you know build applications uh, to serve more people they can kind of like uh, you know acquire services from each one of us like seamlessly so yeah so so that's my take awesome thank you Betty um, Tyrone I'll let you close it out if you got any thoughts yeah uh, totally agree with Betty and the fundamental level of the privacy field, I think that, as I mentioned, is actually a flexible privacy method we can choose. So, um, so for you know enterprise users and for uh, normally default users, and in both those perspective, uh, actually, um, I, there there is um, you know some like uh, anonymous mining 
uh, like this again play on d5 to to play when you know you know manta has deployed a launch uh you know the anonymous swap or uh with um you know other integrate with the uh, other different products and um and actually i also think that you know the the privacy field is on the um you know a, a start stage uh it's, it's in the early stage and some of it uh integrated with you know zk snark and other mixes you receive a note or something uh you receive uh you know a certification after you um generated by the uh you know zero knowledge uh mechanism and actually isn't i think is for now it's hard to integrate with um some of you know derivative for example that include futures and uh and some of the derivatives like uh, you know staking derivatives but uh actually in the future we can see that um some of the actually proofs or notes can be uh fully uh, integrate with you know with, with the uh, uh, privacy products. So uh, yeah, I'm really exciting and looking forward to it. Just just one thing, Kenny. I wanted to bring up also with regards to privacy, actually, because uh, everyone is talking about privacy in terms of transacting and transferring value and assets between addresses. But um, like just one idea that came up, uh, uh, came into my mind just now, is that uh, there is actually application of uh, this privacy solutions as an intermediate layer for applications, which might have a lot, a lot of sense. Um, like um, as you know, we we are building the. Uh, audiobook based exchange and uh, obviously the excessive transparency in terms of placing for example limit orders in the audiobook might have the negative impact on the overall system right because it actually has implied risk of front front running if you know uh, how much assets actually the particular trader has on their account and obviously if we can integrate some privacy solution that will hide the particular holder of the account uh, behind uh, the hood, it makes a lot of sense and will eliminate certain risks of, for example, front running uh, that I just mentioned. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with it. Yeah, I also want uh, uh, to say some extra to point out the, you know, the MBB attack for users like me, you know, I, I used to put, you know, three ether into into the pool and what I get just two and uh, that's 0 0.2 ether and I get back. So that's actually, I saw the ether scan and my queue is actually being attacked by one before me and one later than me. And that's, that's the, that's the, I think that's the serious problem that um, occur in blockchain and not even the uh, Ethereum because the validator in, you know, uh, Ethereum 2.0 or developer in Pokdor, they also have the right to, you know, to to execute the order of the um, transaction in the block. So uh, that's actually a serious problem, and uh, and I think that the only solution for it is not to change the mechanism, but the privacy field will change it, and uh, from the you know the source of the uh the transaction yeah yeah when it comes to privacy and mev uh front running right these are this is a whole topic onto itself but unfortunately you know we're we're at time and we've got to get to our final panel thank you guys really appreciate your time thank you for being here uh, i think we got a lot of really great insight and thanks for uh, being so resilient <laughs> we jumped from one one to another and you know all still here um, awesome. So, uh, yeah, with that being said, right, like I can invite you guys off stage and, uh, again, thank you for your time and we'll be preparing for the third and final question or panel. <laughs>